The Sinister Schoolmaster by Rosemary Timpley Peter wanted to go to the comprehensive school because most of his friends in the area were going there. His mother, however, wanted him to go to a small private school where he'd get individual attention. His father kept quiet and left mother and son to fight it out. I don't want individual attention, Peter said. I'd rather be one of the mob. I don't mind a bit of roughness if that's what you're afraid of. If I'm bashed, I can bash back. That, said his mother, is the very attitude I want you to discard. You tend to turn life into a battlefield. This nice little school should make you more gentlemanly. Peter gave a voiced imitation of someone being sick. Don't be disgusting, she snapped. It's time you were taught some manners. They say on the telly that it's parents that's responsible for their children's manners, said Peter. So if I'm awful, it's because of the way I've been upbrung. Brought up, she corrected him automatically. Why, said Peter, you cling, you clung, you ring, you rung, you bring, you brung. You ring, you rang, or you have rung, she corrected him. You ding, you dung, he muttered. What did you say? Nothing. I should think so. You start at St. Edmund's tomorrow, Peter, and nothing you can say will make me change my mind. St. Edmund's, he moaned. I expect the head has long white hair with a halo bounced on top. But he knew that the battle was lost. His mother was only a woman but she was tough as old rope when she set her mind on anything. And she wanted her son to be a gentleman. It made you mad. He thought longingly of the state school where his mates were going, and where some of the teachers even looked like human beings. He was full of gloom when he set out next morning for the first day of term. He got on the bus wearing his prissy uniform and carrying small case with pencils, pens, rubber, compasses and similar daft things. The bus ride took about 15 minutes then. Church Road, the conductor said, and Peter knew that was where he must get off. He alighted and the friendly old bus trundled away, leaving him alone on the edge of a new world. It was then that the fog descended. It came down suddenly, cold and grey and blanketing, sending a shiver through him. He had been told which way to walk, and now began to plod along a road with tall trees on either side. They were menacing, like sentinels. They watched and whispered. Peter was unusually quick enough to be brave and defiant when there was something to defy. But in this blind-making fog, all he could do was put one foot in front of the other and grow more and more uneasy. He suddenly felt afraid of this new school. All the same, he was grateful to see a light at last, though it must be a light from the hated school. Yes, there was a driveway, and a building crouching further on, with one single golden eye glaring at him. It struck him as odd, there was only one light on in the building. 
he knew it was a small school, but surely there should be more than one lighted classroom, for the window was that of a classroom, and class had started. So he realised with dismay that he must be late. You could say he was delayed by the fog, of course, although he hadn't got lost or anything. Had he? He went closer to the window and looked in. About a dozen boys sat there in similar uniforms to his own. That meant he'd found the right school anyway. The boys sat very attentively. They were pale of face and their eyes were scared. The teacher was at the desk in front of them. He was a short, bull-shouldered man with a red face and white hair, which was long at the sides, but left a pink halo of baldness top back of his head. He was gesticulating with his right hand and carried something tucked under his left arm, ready for use. It was a cane. He asked the boy a question. The boy answered. Peter couldn't hear what was said, but the teacher gave a wolfish smile and beckoned to the boy, who came out to the front and bent over. The schoolmaster seized the cane in his right hand, raised it, and brought it down crackingly hard on the boy's bottom. He hit him again, and again, and again, and his expression was joyful. Stop that! shouted Peter. The class froze. The teacher turned towards the window. Pale, grey eyes peered into dark grey fog. The man marched across and flung open the window. Who is that? You boy, out there, what did you say? I said stop that, Peter answered. Thick arms, like a couple of tree trunks, shot out at the window and grabbed him by the shoulders. He dropped his case on the grass. He struggled. Useless. He was lugged inside. The window was closed again. Peter was dumped on the classroom floor, the man with the cane looming over him. A terrible stillness seemed to have descended. The boys were quiet and motionless, seeming hardly to breathe. The man stood like a statue of wrath. Peter had to admit to himself that he was very frightened indeed. Then the silence was broken. And who, asked the sinister schoolmaster, are you? Peter Lorimer. And what are you doing here? I'm a pupil here. It's my first day. Your first day? What? My first day being here. Your first day being here? What? My first day being here at this school. Your first day being here at this school? What? This school called St. Edmund's, said Peter. This school called St. Edmund's? What? A rotten dump, said Peter, exasperated. Stand up. Peter stood. Bend over. Peter bent. 
crack. The cane came down on his bottom. Did you enjoy that, Peter Lorimer? No. No. What? No, I didn't enjoy it. Crack came the cane. No, you didn't enjoy it. What? Screams this maniac. A whisper from the class. Say, sir. Silence for a moment. The fog thickened outside. The oppressiveness of fear thickened too. Peter felt half paralyzed in this nightmare. He was full of pain, yet it was a dead sort of pain. Felt yet, not felt. Weird. Now the teacher spoke. There is no pupil called Peter Lorimer in this school. You are an imposter. Why are you wearing a school uniform? I am a pupil. My mother sent me. Your mother sent you what? Sir! Another swish from the cane. That's not fair, said Peter. I said, sir. That was for being a liar. Swish! And that was for arguing about it. Now go and sit at that desk. Peter obeyed. Let's see how much you know. You imposter in the uniform of St. Edmunds, of which I am proud to be headmaster. I go, I went, I come. He stopped and waited. He really is stark raving bonkers, thought Peter. But lunatics must be humoured. So he said, hopefully, You come, sir. The boy is a half-wit, a dunderhead. I come. Again, he waited. Thank you for coming, said Peter, adding a hasty, Sir! Heaven grant me patience. Listen, I go, I went, I come. Light dawned. The silly clot wanted the past tense of come. I came, said Peter. I bring. I brung. You what? I brung, sir. Brung? 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 Anyone heard the words brung? A titter of a psychophantish laughter from the class. Peter's conversation with his mother came blessedly back to him. I brought, he said. I ring. I rung. No, take that back. I rang. Or I have rung. Uh, like you'd say, I rang up or I have rung up. I wonder what strange country this boy comes from mocked the teacher. And what strange language they speak there. Rang up? Rung up? What does it mean? It means what it says, sir. Like when you ring someone up on the telephone. The what? 
the telephone. Telly? As in television? Telegram? Telly? Communications? His voice faded as the teacher's face turned a deeper shade of crimson. Thank you, said the man. Thank you, Peter Lorimer, for breaking into my class, disturbing my lesson, dressing up in our school uniform, pretending to be a pupil, and then talking a lot of gibberish. If there are any words to be invented here, I will do the inventing. I'm not inventing anything. You were not inventing anything what? Sir! Stand up. Bend over. Swish. 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 Went the cane. In Peter's ears, it seemed to turn into the sound of a raging wind or a thundering waterfall. His ears would burst. And it seemed suddenly as if they did. There was a sort of explosion in his head. Light blazed. He found himself lying on the pavement and people were gathering around him. He supposed that the teacher had beaten him unconscious, then carried him here, bleeding and bruised. For he saw the tall trees which lined the road up to the school. The fog had gone. He's coming round, a woman said. It's all right, lovey. You're all right now. She helped him to his feet. What happened, old son? A man asked. He was trying to beat me to death, said Peter. He's mad. Kid's been dreaming, said another voice. No signs of damage on him, are there? No, just a little faint. That's all it was, said the woman brushing the pavement dust from his blazer. Where do you live? Peter told her. One of the men offered to drive him home. He hardly spoke in the car. He felt exhausted. The driver dropped him at his own gate. Shall I come in with you? He offered. Will anyone be there? Yes, Thank you. My mother's there. Uh, thanks for the lift. You go in and have a good rest, said the man, and drove off. Peter let himself into the house. His mother heard him and came into the hall, frowning. Oh, Peter, how could you be so naughty? She said, The headmaster's been on the phone to me. I don't care what he said about me, Peter said. It was a horrible and cruel and mad. I'm never going back there. He tried to murder me. And he poured out the whole story. His mother listened. His tone was so convincing that she half believed him. Then she said, You had such a beating. Let's see how sore you are. I should think I'd be scarred for life, said Peter, pulling down his trousers and wondering, as he did so, why his bottom didn't hurt. His mother looked. There isn't a mark on you, she declared, not even the smallest bruise. You've been telling me lies, dangerous lies too. If you were older, you could be had up for slander for making accusations like that against the headmaster. 
and I know for a fact that you did not turn up at the school at all this morning, because the head rang out to ask why you hadn't arrived. Oh, Peter, what am I going to do with you when you behave like this? I know you didn't want to go there, but to tell these wicked lies... I wasn't telling lies, cried Peter. It happened, and all in that dreadful fog. There has been no fog, none at all, except in your perverse mind, she said. He went very cold. All the indignation died out of him. He whispered, If it didn't happen, yet it did. What happened? Who was the man with the white hair and red face and thick arms and shoulders? And a beastly smile. And a voice which seemed to cut through you just as the cane did. Who was he? An invented character in your story, said his mother. The headmaster of St. Edmund's is tall, dark, rather thin, and has a very nice smile. I went to see him before I decided to send you there. Peter felt dazed and ill. It had all been too much. You could go on fighting against circumstance for just so long. And then he broke into tears. As he melted, so did his mother. She took him in her arms. Oh, darling, what is all this about? She said. Why did you make up that story? Did you really think I'd believe it? It happened, wept Peter. Where have you really been all morning? Where I said, then I found myself lying in the street and a man drove me home. What man? I don't know. A nice man. They were all very nice. The passers-by who stopped to pick me up, they were kind. People should always be kind. Not like him. That, that sinister schoolmaster. Even if his home was sometimes a battlefield, his mother now proved a gentle victor. She was so unaccustomed to seeing him cry that she realized something must be badly wrong. She took him up to bed, tucked him in with a hot water bottle, kissed him on the forehead and told him to go to sleep. He did sleep too, deeply dreamlessly. It was evening when he woke, blinking contentedly in the safety of his own little room. Then his father came in. Your mother's been telling me. It all happened, Dad. Honest. His father sat on the end of the bed. We know now that you went to the school, Peter, although no one saw you there. Your case was found outside one of the classroom windows. That's right, said Peter. I dropped it when that dreadful headmaster dragged me inside. No one dragged you inside, said his father. Your mother did wonder if there could be something in your story. As you were so upset... So she went to the school this afternoon. She thought maybe one of the teachers was like the man you described. No one there is even remotely like him. No one there now, that is. 
No one there now? Peter echoed. The head, Mr. Rennick, has come to see you. He wants to talk to you about it. He went to fetch the other man, and Peter waited. If that villain with the cane walked in. A tall, dark, anxious-faced man came in and closed the door behind him. He had a book under his arm, not a cane. Hello, Peter. I'm Mr. Rennick, the headmaster of St. Edmund's. Then who was the man with the white hair? Peter asked. Ever heard of John Bashman, nicknamed Old Basher? Mr. Rennick asked him. Peter shook his head. Here's a picture of him. Mr. Rennick opened the book called History of St. Edmund's School and displayed a full page illustration. It was a reproduction of the portrait of a man in colour. A white haired, red faced, thick bodied man. It was labelled John Bashman, the first headmaster. That's him, said Peter. That's the man who beat me. That man has been dead for a hundred years. He wasn't nicknamed Old Basher for nothing. He caned the pupils for the smallest misdemeanor. He was a sadistic bully to my mind, but in those days, beatings in school were more common than they are now. It was an age of violence. Now, your story is that you looked through the classroom window and saw him there. That he dragged you inside and so on. He did, in that awful fog. There was no fog. It was a bright morning. The teacher you spent all morning in that classroom was taking physics. It's a lab rather than an ordinary classroom. You realize now, don't you? You had some sort of dream awake, a hallucination of some kind. You mean I saw ghosts of the past? Peter said calmly. That would be why he'd never heard of the telephone or television. He said I was talking gibberish and that if anyone was going to invent words, he would do it. It was all a dream, Peter. You never wanted to come to my school. You were resentful about it. Your mother says you dashed out without any breakfast. So, you were empty. You got to the school, couldn't face going in, dumped your case, fled back to the road, and then you fainted. Overwrought nerves. While unconscious, you had this dream. Does that make sense to you? I suppose so. But it must have been more than an ordinary dream, as old Basher really did exist. Yes, and I expect you read about him somewhere and forgotten. What the conscious mind forgets, the unconscious retains. That's my explanation. It makes more sense than ghosts. There are no such things. He spoke confidently, almost arrogantly. He wouldn't be so cocky about it if he had old Basher standing over him with that cane, Peter thought. And suddenly, behind the headmaster's shoulder, he saw a shadow forming. The shadow gained colour and solidity. It seemed to have sprung in some curious way from the illustration in the open book, which Mr. Rennick had placed on the shelf behind him. There was the white hair. 
the red face, the thick body, the raised arm with the cane in it, the curling smile, the pale eyes glaring at the back of the headmaster's head. Imposter! Spat the lips. Or that could have been the sound of the rain falling on the leaves in the garden. The arm with the cane was raised higher. Look out! screamed Peter. Old Basher is just behind you! He's going to wallop you! As the cane descended, Mr. Rennick gave a cry and the lights went out. Peter went right down under the bedclothes, in case old Basher started on him next. A few moments later, the bedclothes were pulled away from him. His mother was bending over him. The room was dimly lit by light from the passage. His father was outlined in the doorway. Mr. Rennick was rubbing his head. It's all right, Peter, his mother was saying. The electric bulb fell out of its socket and hit poor Mr. Rennick on the head. That's why the light went out. She turned to the headmaster. My fault, that. I couldn't have fixed it properly when I put it in the other day. I've always told you to leave that sort of job to me, Peter's father said irritably. Sorry about this, Mr. Rennick. Come downstairs and have a drink. The two men departed. But before he left the room, Mr. Rennick gave Peter a long, suspicious look. Now, his mother fussed over him a little and he lay down to sleep. Strangely, he no longer felt afraid of old Basher, who had so obviously had dipped in for Mr. Rennick rather than himself. Resented anyone else taking over the school, even a hundred years afterwards. That would be it. Peter did, however, feel a little afraid of the book Mr. Rennick had given him. When he went to St. Edmund's, there wouldn't be any beating or cruelty, but he wouldn't be popular. The head definitely didn't like or trust him. Oh, life could be hell sometimes. It really could. He slept. In the morning, his mother brought him breakfast in bed. You're going to stay at home today, she said. Then your father and I will arrange for you to go to the comprehensive. Wow! He nearly hit the ceiling with relieved delight. Peter, be careful, you'll spill your tea. What made you change your mind? He asked her. I didn't. She said rather grimly. Mr. Rennick changed his. He said he didn't want you at the school. He said some neurotic children cause outbreaks of poltergeist activity, and he didn't want the pleasant atmosphere of St. Edmund's disturbed. He struck me a pretty neurotic himself. She added, What a fuss to make over a falling light bulb. As if you could possibly have been responsible for that. It was old Basher, thought Peter. Clever old ghost. Then his father descended upon him. Enjoying your breakfast and the good news? He said, sardonically. You cunning little devil. You were determined to get your own way, weren't you? Tell me. How did you wangle that poltergeist effect? I didn't, Peter began. It was old. Then he stopped. It would be no use telling his father the truth. 
he had a skeptical nature, limited, lacking in imagination. Still, he wasn't a bad sort. Peter smiled. His father winked and departed. In fact, Peter felt friendly towards everyone this morning. Even old Basher. Especially old Basher. But for him, Peter would have had to go to St. Edmund's. Thank you, he said impulsively and aloud, as an echo in the air, or maybe it was only the gurgling of the water pipe, said, Thank you what? And Peter bellowed back, Sir!